thank you all so much for joining us today uh, with the museum at Eldridge Street and also with Dr. Zachary Mazur of the Poling Museum, Museum of the History of Polish Jews. So before I introduce Dr. Mazur, I just wanna go over some housekeeping with all of you. You are all currently muted. If you have questions, I invite you to please put them into the chat box and we will answer them during Q&A at the end of the program. Um, what you see on the slide right now, this is an image of the museum at Eldridge Street. We are located in New York City's Lower East Side. If you've never been here before, I welcome you to please come and visit us. We're open Sunday through Fridays, 10 to 5 p.m. And we also have a amazing uh, roster of both in-person and virtual programs. And actually, if Dr. Mazur, thank you. So just this week, in this upcoming week, we are going to have a book launch featuring the celebrated author Leah Koenig's book, new book, all about Rome's Jewish kitchen. And we'll be joined by the celebrated writer Arthur Schwartz and James Beard Award winning Roseanne Gold. So it's an in-person program this Tuesday. It should be wonderful. We'll have a little reception afterwards. Oops. Um, and it'll be great to see so many of you in person for that. Then on Sunday, we are going to have another in-person concert with the violinist Jake Schulman and the cantor Yul Cohn. And that should also be an incredibly moving performance. And that's this Sunday, upcoming Sunday, October 22nd at three o'clock. And finally, uh, for those of you who are not located in New York City or locally, in the tri-state area, we do have a, another virtual program on October 30th, all about how the different streets on the Lower East Side got their names. So it's from colonial, colonial executions to American presidents. Um, you'll learn about how the streets of the Lower East Side came to be. So now a little bit about Dr. Mazur. Zachary Mazur earned his PhD at Yale University. He studied under Professor Timothy Snyder. And he's also the author of numerous articles and is finishing a book on Jews, Ukrainians, and Poles in Poland's economy during the 1920s and 30s. And currently, he is the senior historian at the Poling Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. So please, if you can wave and snap, do whatever you can do uh, to please welcome Dr. Mazur with us today. So go ahead. Hello, hello. Thank you all. And uh, and thank you, Sophie, uh, for welcoming me here once again uh, with Eldridge. It's great, great to be doing programming with you guys. And uh, so happy to see all of you online here. Um, I want to reiterate what, what Sophie said, that it's yeah, really important in this time that we have this community. So so thank you for, for joining us. So we're going to talk about uh, the shtetl today. And I'm sure that many of you know, the shtetls were, were small towns uh, in Eastern Europe. They were, you know, majority Jewish or, or largely populated by Jews. And uh, I want to start with just a quick overview of, uh, of how and why the Jews ended up in Eastern Europe in the first place. And, you know, why did they go there? Why did they end up organizing their lives in this form to, to create the shtetl? So the first place where we need to start is with a little bit of geography. Uh, what we're looking at here is a map of the, the shtetl land, uh, and this is the, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth um, from the uh, 16th, 17th century. And it roughly maps onto, so this is a, a map uh, of today's Europe, obviously, mapped onto the borders of today's Europe. And so you can see the countries uh, that are included in, in, this, uh, in this shtetl land. Um, and so why did the Jews end up going to this particular part? Well, many Jews, the Ashkenazi Jews in particular, lived in what is now Northern France, Western Germany, and they were drawn eastward by um, the, the problems, first of all, the problems of the places where they were living. They had, they had limited freedoms. Uh, in many cases, they were kicked out of German towns. Um, they were banned from living in many different places. And at the same time, they were getting a better deal somewhere else. So there were uh, arrangements that were offered to them, particularly by Polish noblemen in the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, um, that drew them away from Western Europe into the East. And, um, and this had a lot to do with the peculiarities of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, because um, within that 
weird place, that weird state. It was not a centralized state, but there were a bunch of noble families who had a lot of power over their land. And within that land, they could have a town. They owned the town, literally. Um, and then, therefore, they could make whatever laws they wanted to within these towns. Um, and so they made arrangements with Jewish communities. And these arrangements were obviously, they had obligations, Jews had obligations to the, the noblemen, uh, like paying taxes, they had to engage in trade, uh, and for example, sell alcohol. Selling alcohol was a privilege only of the nobility, but, uh, but that privilege could be leased by Jews. Um, and uh, yeah, so the nobles just benefited from, from this arrangement because they basically made the Jews uh, conduct business for them. And, uh, and in exchange, the Jews also got benefits. They uh, were most importantly allowed to practice their religion as they pleased. They could print books uh, and they could uh, pursue all kinds of intellectual pursuits that were uh, basically limited or illegal in other European contexts at the time. And for the average shtetl Jew, religious tolerance was, uh, was the most important factor drawing them to, to the East. And then around uh, the end of the 18th century, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth starts to, starts to fall apart and it collapses and, uh, and the neighbors take it apart. So Russia, Prussia, and Austria all uh, take chunks out of Poland. Um, and this becomes the, the period of the, the so-called partitions. Uh, and what happens to the Jews at this point? Well, the Jews become subjects of these empires of, of Prussia, Austria, and Russia. And it is at this point that Polish Jews essentially become Russian Jews or Austrian Jews, uh, Galicianers, as, as they become uh, known later on. Um, but of course, the, the language of the shtetl remains Yiddish throughout this period, and their identity is still very much Jewish. So the fact of Polish, uh, Poland, Lithuania falling apart and the partitions, uh, it has less to do with, uh, with the identity of Jews and changing sort of their uh, how they see themselves, but uh, but the environment around them changes. The legal environment, uh, especially, changes. So, um, from this period of tolerance, we get we come to a period of intolerance, uh, especially within the Russian Empire. The Russian Empire um, had the most restrictive policy on Jews. There were bans on on settlement outside of towns, uh, and Jews had to stay within the pale of settlement and the Kingdom of Poland. So we're looking at a map now of the, the Pale of Settlement um, and, and, uh, and the Kingdom of Poland. And you can see the, uh, the Jewish population here is marked. So we have uh, 1.3 million Jews in, in the Kingdom of Poland, 1.4 million in Ukraine, um, another uh, 700,000 in Lithuania, uh, and on and on. So a very, a very large uh, portion of, of the world's Jewish population was located just in this in this little uh, section of Russia. Um, and at this time, the former Polish owners of the towns, um, they, in many cases, had their, their towns confiscated from them, uh, and Russian owners were, were buying them. Um, and uh, and they, they quite liked them because they had a, a valuable asset. Uh, unlike the serfs, Jews were taxpaying people, so they were quite valuable. At this time, um, for long periods of time, we could we could see that there was a, a key sort of rhythm to the shtetl life. Uh, you know, life was was organized around family, religion, professions. Um, each week, obviously, uh, was looking forward to the Shabbat meal on Friday night, uh, and then the market fair on Sunday. And so we have a couple of of photographs here of of uh, market fairs. Um, from this, this is from a, a later period, obviously when we have photography. But um, but at this point, uh, it was very much a, a hermetically uh, sealed Jewish world. There were, of course, contacts with uh, with people outside of the of the Jewish community, um, and these would happen, like at the market, um, in other business transactions, or in taverns and inns. Uh, there were there were times when when people would be uh, interacting with with other uh, with Christians uh, with other groups, um, but uh, but for the most part, it's very much a, a Jewish world. 
Um, then when we come up to the, the 19th century, uh, this is when the, the shtetl uh, starts to enter a phase of transition. Um, there was a brief golden age, right, as the, the Russians took over this formerly Polish land. Uh, there was some stability uh, within this new, new arrangement. And then a steady decline uh, starting from the middle of the 19th century. So why did the shtetl, the shtetl start to decline? If we take our hints from Fiddler on the Roof, then we might think that it's anti-Semitism that drove people out of these towns. They, uh, you know, feared for their safety and therefore started to leave. Um, but the truth is that uh, these the decline of these towns began long before pogroms uh, threatened anybody. So um, there's a, a, a much larger uh, economic transition that was underway during the 19th century. And of course, this is a global phenomenon of industrialization. Uh, but for the Jewish community, uh, this had a huge impact on, on their lives because Jews had, in many cases, they were involved in crafts. They were shoemakers, tailors, blacksmiths. Um, and with the advent of industrialization, their jobs were being replaced by industrial goods. Um, so factory produced shoes and clothes and tools could be provided much more, more cheaply and directly to, to the customer. And um, on this uh, photograph here, we have a, a picture of a, a huge textile factory that was in Wuj. Wuj is a city uh, west of Warsaw. This particular factory was owned by Israel Poznański. He was a, a Jewish industrialist. Um, but he also employed masses of, of Jewish laborers. So um, the, the factory and, and, all, and the city in general, which was a, a very a kind of boom town for uh, textile manufacturing, um, it was a, a sign of the transition out of the shtetls and into the cities. So people were moving, not necessarily to the United States right away, but uh, in many cases, people were transitioning to just a larger city uh, close by looking for work because the, these uh, traditional shtetl relationships and, and uh, economic relationships that existed for centuries had completely fallen apart by the middle of the 19th century. Um, and another huge factor here was the advent of the railway. Uh, no surprise that uh, the railway affected how, how people were um, interacting with the world. So they could obviously travel, uh, but it also meant the import of goods and, uh, and here we have a map of the growing rail network within the Russian Empire, uh, which was a late bloomer in terms of, um, you know, comparing to, to say, Great Britain or Germany or the United States. Um, but the, the rail network was especially dense around the Pale of Settlement. And, and so this had a huge impact on, uh, on Jewish life at this time. Um, and so shuttles sort of become like the Rust Belt uh, that we can see in other in other contexts. Um, some of these towns were were completely emptied out by the 19th century, by the end of the 19th century, rather. Um, and so uh, we can see, for example, uh, within our own family stories, I'm sure that you could you could trace these within your own uh, genealogies. Um, but in my family, for example, the uh, the family moved from. Krasnik, which was the, the shtetl, they then went on to Warsaw, and from Warsaw, eventually they moved to the United States. Um, and this mass migration really begins uh, with uh, in 1881. Um, and that had, had a lot to do with, uh, with growing uh, incidents of, of anti-Semitic violence uh, within the Russian Empire, uh, but a bunch of other factors as well. Uh, like industrialization or, or rail networks or even uh, available cash to be able to afford the, uh, the trip across the ocean. Uh, but on this map, you can see uh, almost 2 million Jews from the Pale of Settlement uh, moved from 1881 to 1914, moved from the Pale of Settlement to the United States. So huge number of, of people moving, uh, moving across the world here, as you can see. Um, so in the context of this economic decline, Hasidism really became a force uh, within, within the, the shtetls. Um, and this led to, to the emancipation of large groups of people as well. Um, as, many as, you, as many of you know, Hasidism is a, is a form of popular mysticism with, uh, with palpable social and political power. 
um, some of the things that are characteristic of Hasidism are you know, prayer that is reminiscent of, of the evangelical movement in Christianity, speaking in tongues, fear and trembling at the awesomeness of God. Um, and they, uh, Hasidim gained popularity not just through the power of their theological arguments or their charisma, of course, they had plenty of that as well, but because Hasidic groups tended to use uh, social programs and charity as a way to draw people in. And, and Chabad Lubavitch, which I'm sure many of you many of you know, is still doing this today, right? They, they provide all kinds of services in order to draw people in and, um, and endear themselves to people. So all this is to say that Hasidism was more than just a religious movement. It was a massive, massive social movement. And in many ways, Hasidism continues uh, the, the shtetl tradition today, carrying the torch for, for certain towns where the court of one rabbi or another is still known by the name of their ancestral shtetl. Um, but with all of this uh, positivity that may have come with some Hasidic groups, uh, the separateness of, of Hasidism also uh, created issues and, and conflict uh, within the shtetl. Um, so they were a minority, but an important influential and growing influence throughout this time. Um, and with the entrance of any newcomer, you could expect a, a reaction, sometimes a negative reaction. Uh, and the traditional religious elites uh, were quite opposed to this new movement, the, the Hasidic movement. And so they wanted to maintain what they saw as the orthodoxy. And they became known as the misnagdim or the mitnagdim, uh, the opponents. And they were generally in, intellectually led by, by the Vilna Gaon, the, the genius of Vilna, um, who was focused on using his superior intellectual powers to sort of uh, de deconstruct the, the arguments of the Hasidim. Um, another group that was very strongly opposed to Hasidism were the modernizers. And um, these were the people of the Haskalah movement, sometimes called the Muscadim. Um, and they were generally people who were arguing for the assimilation or acculturation of Jews into the majority culture. So depending on the context, this could be uh, into Russian culture, or into Polish culture, into German culture, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, but colloquially they, were, colloquially, they were often called Germans uh, because many of them were actually uh, assimilating into, into German culture. So within each shtetl, you would have separate places of worship, uh, separate teachings, separate schools for all of these, these different groups. And ultimately, um, all of these were, were responses to modernity. They were responses to a transition out of the traditional society that had created the shtetl into a, a, a society of individuals who are making their own decisions and, and trying to find a way forward both economically, but also spiritually and socially. Uh, so all of this is happening within the, the shtetl environment. And as we get up to the, the period right around the First World War, um, these various groups within the shtetl sort of transition into political powers, uh, political parties, rather. Uh, so even, even before um, there was the, the ability to vote, because actually uh, within the Russian Empire, there was very little uh, official politics that were allowed uh, until the, the 1917 revolution. Uh, but Jews were still involved in political movements uh, nonetheless during this period. And each one of these represented a, a different vision of the future. They represented an answer to a, a question or big questions like, where should Jews live? What language should they speak? Um, you know, should they should they assimilate or should they try to remain separate from uh, from the majority culture. Um, and one of those huge movements, of course, was Zionism. Uh, there were many, many different flavors of Zionism, as there are still today. Um, we can see here, I mean, I'm listing so left, right, religious, secular, uh, but uh, all of these can be can be seen uh, within the uh, Israeli political scene today. Um, and Zionists, of course, were arguing that uh, that Jews should go somewhere else. They should leave Europe and uh, and have a state of their own, have a, a land of their own, um, and and leave Europe behind. Bundism uh, was a Yiddish-speaking labor movement, 
And they were arguing that people didn't need to leave, that Jews did not need to leave Europe, that their home was in Europe um, and they should find a way to, to better their lot uh, through, their, their, um, through, their, through, through strikes and through other uh, union, um, union activities, uh, but within Europe. And finally, Agudat Israel was the, the next largest uh, party, also anti-Zionist, uh, but a, focused around uh, religious people. So it was a, a party that appealed to the Orthodox, to the Hasidim, um, but was arguing not that people needed to, to leave Europe, but they should rather stay and, uh, and cultivate Jewish life within Europe. So even before, um, before the the advent of voting, um, there there were many many groups that were coming together uh, and and sort of organizing life around these political movements. And the Zionists uh, especially were were very well organized and put and put an emphasis on this social component. So they had uh, scouting groups and they also provided healthcare and food uh, and childcare. And these youth groups and, and clubs became very popular within the shtetls. Uh, and so we have we have a picture here of the Hashomer Hatzair, which was a Zionist scouting group. Uh, the picture that in the center there is from the town of Pinsk um, and another uh, another uh, political club up there on the on the right uh, from Pinsk as well. And so I, I want to transition uh, actually to some specific towns since I haven't mentioned any yet. But Pinsk is is one of those uh, one of these towns that is uh, uh, certainly a shtetl, um, and it's uh, quite an interesting place. It was seventy eight percent Jewish, um, and the surrounding areas were mostly populated by Orthodox Christians, but some Catholics as well. Um, and they had a, kind of a booming business with uh, with fishing and lumber. Uh, it was uh, located in a in an area with a bunch of marshes and and swamps, um, but this was kind of an an island of civilization in Pinsk and a, and a bustling town. Um, and you can see the the picture here is of a a market that was actually on the water. So because of all the the swampy areas, people would use their boats to get around, and they could come on the river um, on the Pina River and. Uh, and meet up right here, uh, dock their boat, and then sell their goods right away. Um, and then we have a picture of the, the synagogue on the right. Uh, another quite interesting town is Shadova. Uh, Shadova is today in, in Lithuania. And it's a, it was a rather typical small shtetl uh, near Kaunas, uh, the uh, kind of second city of Lithuania. Um, on the right, we have a picture of a birthday party from the interwar period. And on the left, a picture of a, a tea house, which uh, famously did not have a license to sell alcohol, but uh, everybody kind of walked out of there drunk. So the, the authorities often got interested in, in that place, trying to figure out what was going on. But that was a, a Jewish establishment. Um, I bring up this example. I mean, I, I want to talk about examples from, from each of these contexts, but I bring up this example in particular because uh, there is a, an ongoing project right now to open uh, the Lost Shtetl Museum. That's the, the name of it, the Lost Shtetl Museum. Uh, and it's going to be opened in, uh, in Shadova, in this town. Um, and it's a, a huge space that's, that's scheduled to be open next year, uh, a very worthy endeavor. And uh, so I am looking forward to, to checking it out when it's, when it's open. Um, another, another interesting town example that I have here is, is Szczuczyn. Not an easy one to say, Szczuczyn, uh, which is in Poland today, and um, and Szczuczyn is uh, is unique, uh, partly because we have a ton of photographs from from this town from uh, the Jewish community in Szczuczyn, uh, and that's because uh, there was a man who owned a, a photo studio, Zelman Kaplan, uh, and he left behind literally literally hundreds of photographs of of people in the town. And these are just lovely scenes of, of everyday life in the shuttle. Um, and it's uh, it's quite a quite a treasure to be able to, to look at these. And um, another another example uh, of a, a shuttle would be Drohobic. Drohobic is today in Ukraine. Um, and here we have some oil derricks. That's not something that you might uh, 
associate with with this part of the world. But um, but actually, uh, before the First World War, uh, Galicia, the the area of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and then uh, in Poland later on after World War One, um, was one of the highest oil producing regions in the world. Um, and many, many Jews were involved in the oil business. Uh, and Drahovich was one of these towns that really benefited from, from the oil business. And so as a result, it became kind of a, a cultural hub because of its wealth. Um, and in that, in that way, it's kind of an exception to the many other shtetl towns where as the world was modernizing, the shtetl sort of fell backwards. But in this case, uh, as the world was modernizing and got interested in oil, then, um, then Drahovich did did quite well. So, a couple of examples of uh, of how this this cultural wealth became um, more widely known. Uh, this is uh, Maurice Gottlieb, who was uh, from Drahovich. Um, he, despite the fact that he died at at twenty three, um, he left behind more than three hundred paintings, and uh, and he's thought to be one of the the greatest Jewish artists of the nineteenth century. He studied in, in Vienna and Krakow, um, and, and this painting here on the left is, uh, is of, um, of prayer at Yom Kippur in a synagogue. Um, and, um, and this is in the, uh, in the National Art Museum in, in Jerusalem. Um, but one of the, the unique things about this painting is that he actually, he drew himself into this painting. So if you can, uh, if you look at the photograph and then at the painting, you can see that his face shows up a few times uh, among the people there. Um, and it's even meant to be a kind of funeral for himself. So it's a very kind of self-centered uh, painting. But um, this is another another self-centered painting by him. Um, this is a, a self-portrait that Mauritza Gottlieb did. Uh, and what's unique about this is that he uh, drew himself in the costume of a Polish noble. Um, and so as, as he wrote in, in letters to his friends and, and family, uh, he thought of himself as both a Pole and a Jew. Uh, and this is another kind of response to, to modernity and response to how things were changing. Um, he, he thought of himself as, as being able to belong to both of these groups at the same time. Um, and of course, this would be a debate ongoing throughout the, the next decades and, and, uh, and perhaps longer. Uh, over whether or not Jews could also be Poles. Um, but at this time, um, he was arguing for, for a kind of dual identity, that this was an okay thing for him to be. And so he drew himself in the, the costume of a Polish noble. Uh, quite interesting. But this painting was actually thought to be lost for many years. Uh, it was found uh, a few years ago. It was thought to be lost during World War II, actually. But uh, it was found a few years ago, and then uh, the Polling Museum purchased it, uh, and it is now in our in our main collection. So this is uh, a part of the the main exhibit at Polling Museum in Warsaw. Um, and another famous person from Drachowicz is Bruno Schulz, who many of you may have heard of. Uh, he was a, a novelist, a, a, um, a poet, and and also a visual artist. Uh, and he did many of the, the covers of his own uh, of his own books. And as you can see, actually the the book cover here on the on the left, the sanatorium uh, book, which is uh, the hourglass sanatorium, uh, is how it's translated. Um, he he drew that uh, that lovely little cartoon there uh, as as the cover of the um, of the book. Uh, and same thing with the the other books here. We can see that. Uh, it's, it's Bruno Schultz's style. Um, he unfortunately uh, perished during the Holocaust uh, while he was still living in Drohobich, but uh, managed to produce uh, many, many works uh, during his lifetime. So what remains of the shtetl today? Uh, I want to talk about what's left of these places. There were, there were thousands of shuttles literally and and many of them as i was saying already they, they started to fade at the end of the 19th century um and and then of course the the holocaust completely decimated uh the remaining jewish people um and as time went on a lot of other things were were destroyed as well uh, a lot of the material remains so the most uh sort of accessible 
piece of what remains today uh, is the cultural memory, the folklore, the literature of the shtetl. Um, and in many cases, people did not intend to record the shtetl, but uh, but inadvertently, this was exactly what they were doing. So they bring us some some unique perspectives on this. And I want to highlight just a few authors here um, who wrote in different languages, kind of reflecting their um, their own po politics to some degree, but also their uh, their cultural intervention. Um, Joseph Roth is is a very famous author who uh, many of you have probably heard of. Uh, he came from Galicia. Uh, the region of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, and he wrote in in German. He uh, kind of left and went off to Vienna and made his life in this German-speaking world. Um, but his his novels are are available in English and uh, quite interesting social commentaries on uh, on different options in um, in Jewish life. But his his choice was to assimilate to German culture. Um, I. B. Singer. Also very well-known Nobel laureate uh, who wrote in Yiddish. Uh, also lovely kind of magical realism uh, commentary on, on life uh, in the shtetl and then, and then beyond. Um, Shmuel Agnon, uh, this is a pseudonym, uh, but Agnon was a, was a Zionist uh, and he was one of the first to be writing novels in in Hebrew, um, and at at the end of the nineteenth century, there were people who were attempting to write um, <clears throat> to write poetry in Hebrew, as Hebrew started to become uh, a popular a more popular language. But it was still uh, into the nineteen thirties. There were there were very few, even among the the uh, the committed Zionists, there were very few people who were actually using Hebrew kind of as an everyday language or. Uh, reading newspapers in Hebrew, that kind of thing. So it was that was not very popular, but Agnon was sort of ahead of the head of the curve, um, and and writing uh, beautiful literature uh, in Hebrew, and also a Nobel laureate. Um, and finally, Bruno Schultz, who was writing actually in Polish. Uh, so another kind of uh, perspective on on assimilation, but assimilating towards Polish culture instead of instead of German culture or something else. Um, another another way in which uh, memory has been preserved um, is through Yitzkor books. Uh, Yitzkor books are are something that maybe many of you have heard of. Um, these are memorial books, a sort of the literal uh, translation of it. Um, and uh, in many cases, uh, there were survivors of the Holocaust or emigrants from from the shuttles who uh, gathered their stories and recollections from. Um, from themselves, but also they try to to uh, amass all this information about their town and recreate it in a way. Um, and this came out of the Landsmannschaft and movement. So these were uh, mutual aid societies that were generally uh, organized around a particular town. And out of these organizations grew the Itzker books to preserve the, the memory uh, of those towns. Um, and they started to be produced during the war. So the first one was was put together in 1943, uh, and then they continued to grow on until until the 1970s, uh, with a huge boom right after the war. And many of these were were written in Hebrew or in Yiddish, um, and they have been translated. Many many have been translated, and they're available at JewishGen.org. Uh, if you're interested in looking that, at that, or if you just want to look up Yitzker books, you can see um, the the there are many hundreds of them that are available to read online uh, and can give you a kind of sense of the details of, of life in the shtetls. Um, and at the bottom there, there are two paintings. Uh, these are by Józef Hariton. He was uh, a Polish man who, who lived in, in one of these shtetls. Um, and after the war, he in the 1970s, actually, he started to, uh, to have nightmares uh, with the faces of his former Jewish neighbors. And he said that they, these faces were haunting him so that he he felt this urge to paint them. And he was a self-taught artist, but he started to to put these things down. Um, and, and he tried it to, um, as he said, he tried to paint as many faces as possible until until the voices stopped, which at one point he claimed that they they did stop. So um 
And of course, there are material remains. There are thousands of cemeteries, hundreds of synagogues, midrash and yeshivas, homes, other property, and, and stolen or, or abandoned movable items. Um, and for the most part, so these physical remnants of Jewish communities and heritage, they were horribly neglected during the, the communist period, um, and as were most things, to be honest. But uh, but many, many cemeteries and shiva and synagogues, they, they still remain with us. Um, and uh, if you are interested, you can check out uh, Poland Museum's uh, website, the Virtual Shtetl. Uh, there you can find all kinds of information about specific towns and uh, kind of go through. There's plenty of pictures and, and basic information about, about each town. But in general, I just want to say that, um, you know, the cemeteries have been abandoned um, for for many years for obvious reasons, right? The people who, who would take care of these things traditionally would be the families. The families are not here because of the Holocaust. Um, so uh, many of them have been have been abandoned. But the last 20 years has seen really intense interest in them from local activists who are now being supported by a growing number of, of foundations and, and organizations, um, including including getting a ton of uh, a ton of money from the Polish government to restore cemeteries. Um, and these cemeteries are are truly impressive. I mean, some of them are just magnificent. And and the you know the massive cemetery in Warsaw, the Okopowa Cemetery, um, with uh, I think it's about two hundred fifty thousand graves, it really just can give you a sense of the size of that Jewish community uh, that cannot be represented in any other way. Um, and so uh, it's it's been great to see that there has been so much interest in uh, in trying to restore these cemeteries and and bring back interest to them bring people to respect them. Uh, and Poland Museum has been also working to uh, to reward those people and support them. Um, and there's a, a an award given each year uh, to activists for their work uh, in preserving or promoting Jewish heritage in Poland. Um, and these are all just local volunteers. So in many cases, uh, the, the story that you often hear is that somebody in their town realizes that there's a cemetery that's been abandoned that that no one has been taken care of um and they you know start to ask themselves why and then they keep on digging and digging and digging and then they, they feel like so attached to this thing that they must 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 do something about it um and they you know find funding and they find uh other volunteers and supporters so uh it's been it's been really uh, a great thing to see that there's so much uh interest in taking care of these cemeteries now um, and finally, I just want to mention there are still many beautiful synagogues. Uh, some have fallen into disrepair, um, but there are also a number of them that have been very, very well cared for uh, and, and lovingly restored. So um, this is uh, Weinsut Synagogue in southeastern Poland, uh, a, a popular spot among tourists. Um, and this one has been has been well preserved. It's a it's a museum now uh, that is run by the uh, the Foundation for the Preservation of, of Jewish Heritage. Um, and Tukolchin's uh, synagogue is also a museum. Uh, this one is a regional museum, um, and this is a, a also a very popular spot with with tourists. This is in uh, northeastern Poland, so northeast of Warsaw. Um, and Wodawa synagogue also uh, northeast of Warsaw. Um, but really, just just magnificent buildings, and it's um, it's great to see that uh, that they're being cared for now. Uh, that there's so much interest in in caring for them. Uh, look forward to your questions, and thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Mazur. Yes, if everyone has questions, please put them in the chat box, and we will answer them shortly. Uh, we do have one question. Someone said. Thank you for the insightful talk. We have plans to visit Poland in January. Can you tell us about what exhibitions are going to be on view at the Poland Museum? Sure, I mean, so we have our uh, main exhibition, which is enormous, and uh, it covers a thousand years of, of Jewish history in Poland. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, that's that's plenty. There There is a temporary exhibition 
um, on, I think that in January, you might miss what we have now. But uh, the temporary exhibition that's uh, on display right now is about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Um, and our next exhibition, our next uh, temporary exhibition will actually be about shuttles. So it'll be about uh, the art uh, that was produced in um, in remembering the shuttle and then also uh, about shuttle life more generally. Thank you. And then someone also asked, you mentioned something about the lost shtetl being a museum that's opening next year. Can you tell us a little bit more about what this is? Yeah, so the lost shuttle museum is going to be opening in Lithuania. They uh, supposedly they said that it was going to open this year, but I think that it's going to open next year. So I'm I'm not I'm not so sure. But uh, if you Google lost shuttle shuttle museum, you can you can find out more about that. They have they have a very nice website, uh, kind of detailing the minutia, the stories that uh, that people have kind of forgotten about. Um, with that, with that town, and with other places in Lithuania. So, someone also asked it's a double question: To what extent is Fiddler on the Roof a realistic de depiction of shtetl life? Um, not really. Uh, it's I I think one of one of the big issues is that Jews weren't farmers for the most part, but like the main character that we have is a farmer. Um, and uh, I, I mean, to, to some degree, of course, it, it, um, it kind of, you know, it shows in a cartoony way, the, the social outlay of the, of the town. Um, and, you know, we have the socialist character and we have uh, the tailor and all that kind of stuff. But, um, but it's a, yeah, it's, it's a caricature. It's not, it's not a, a very good representation of, of shtetl life. There, there and, also isn't very much about the religious disputes, which were so, uh, so important in, uh, in shtetl life, and kind of dividing people that way. This person also asked uh, if you could recommend any books for advanced college graduates and high school students on the shtetl or shtetl life. Oh boy, it's it's tough. Um, there is so there is a book by Johanon. Petrovsky Stern, um, the name of which is is escaping me right now. It might be called the Golden Age Shtetl. Uh, that's that's a a book particularly about shtetls in Ukraine. Um, but there there aren't many great books just about shtetls, unfortunately. I I could I get back to this person. Yeah. Um, in fact, it's some people have follow ups with regards to uh, what you said about um, in Fiddler on the Roof and how they weren't farmers. But someone said, well, Tevye was a dairy man and my great grandparents had a dairy in Baiten and left Europe in the 1890s. So something to think about. Um, and another one asked if you could talk a little bit more about daily life in the shtetl, particularly the role of women. Yeah, I, I sincerely apologize for not, not talking more about women. Um, there are just not many great sources about women in the shtetl. Um, what, what I can say is that uh, women were generally literate uh, which is not the same that you could say about the Christian population. If if people were literate, then it was generally the men. Um, women were generally literate, uh, but generally only literate in Yiddish. Um, and so uh, what they consumed uh, would be only you know Yiddish newspapers or or um, or Yiddish books. Uh, one particularly popular book was Senarene, which was kind of a a compendium of different stories. Um, and, uh, it was, it was supposed to be, it was called like the women's Bible, but, uh, it was uh, more of a compendium of different stories and, um, and, and myths, uh, also combined with some Torah and Talmud, uh, but, uh, but for the most part, just kind of a, a mishmash of different things. And that was an extremely influential book, um, and a, a kind of source for what we can understand that women, um, how women understood the world and how they understood their own 
relationship to, to Judaism, for example. Um, so that kind of connects to someone else's question, which is about the languages that mm -hmm. uh, shtetl Jews spoke. Yeah. Um, and they're wondering, did they speak Polish, Russian, German in addition to Yiddish? Did only some of them speak Yiddish? What was the primary language there? So the primary language for everybody was Yiddish. Yiddish is, was universal. Um, and then some people also spoke another language. Um, if they if they had a reason to to speak a different language, there were some. So there were some people who were uh, kind of intentionally assimilating, um, and so there were people who were or occult acculturating themselves. Also, I shouldn't just put that in one category. But um, there were some people who were intentionally trying to learn the the majority language, whether that be German, Polish, Russian. Um, but uh, but for the most part, everyone spoke Yiddish. Um, and then there would be, you know, uh, for, for many centuries, uh, there would be people who would speak kind of at an, at an elementary level, speak many, many languages. So speaking, you know, Ottoman, Turkish, Russian, Polish, German, uh, Czech, uh, and on and on and on. So uh, that was also a kind of common thing. Thank you. Uh, someone, the, it's a, quite a few people are asking specific questions about specific towns in Poland um, that maybe you might know about. I, uh, I, what I can do is, um, can can we just share my email address? And yes. I'll be happy because then, so with the, the uh, question about bibliography, I'll get to that, get back to that person. Please just shoot me an email. Um, Absolutely. I will so share my, that in the chat. Yeah. yeah, great. So please, please feel free to uh, to ask me a question directly, and um, and I'll get back to you. Okay, so I'm gonna put that in here right now. And for people um, specific towns, yeah, I I can probably direct people to to more information about their town or or share what I know about them. So be happy to do that. So his email can be found uh, in the chat right now. Yeah. Uh, the other person is asking about, uh, I guess they can also email you for additional recommendations, but perhaps mm -hmm. many of the, our audience members would be interested in uh, whether or not you might know of any documentary documentaries or films uh, that maybe more accurately depict shuttle life. That's not like Fiddler on the Roof. Hmm. And this is this is particularly for a teaching context too. Yeah, yeah. There are some. So um, during the 1920s and 30s in Poland, there were many Yiddish language films, um, and those might be those might be interesting. I would have to look back and see um, the titles again. One, so one thing that's very popular that I'm sure that many people have heard of is Dibok. Uh, it's been, uh, you know, put on as a play a hundred times or a thousand times. Um, and then it was also made into a movie, I think three or four times it was made into a movie uh, during the 20s and 30s. Um, but that's that's also just kind of a, a fun window and could be a good teaching tool as well. It's also mm. just super interesting to watch Yiddish film. Um, this person says that they, they love the film Laughing in Darkness. Have you seen that? Oh, I, I don't know that one. I will have to look it up. Okay, cool. Uh, I guess we have time for another question or two. Um, someone said, thank you for your wonderful presentation and your generosity okay. and sharing your email for our specific questions. So thank Happy you. Happy to do it. Yeah. Um, let's see, if, did I miss anyone's questions? Someone had a specific question. Someone said, do you have any information about the town of, and I'm gonna butcher this word, Beach, B-I-E-C-Z in Poland. B -I -E -C -Z. I don't. I don't know that one. It's where this person's father uh, came from in 1929. Well, uh, happy to, to look it up and see what I can find for you. And then another final question. At the Poly Museum, 
are there any programs for high school students, internships, summer programs? Yes, we do. So we um, we do internships and um, there are often, uh, we often actually have uh, an intern for the summer from the US. So if somebody is right. interested in This person that, said, can, can also you tell I'm a teacher? And... <laughs> <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Uh, someone actually has a recommendation for uh, another documentary called oh, Three great. Minutes in Poland, documentary mm -hmm. and book by Glenn Kurtz. And if folks are interested in finding Yiddish films, do you have any tips or resources on how to find that? There are a ton on YouTube. So if if you, I mean, if you can find a, a list of Yiddish films, which is not hard to find. Um, if you find a, a list of Yiddish films online, you can look at, look them up on YouTube. And uh, there are many Yiddish films with English, English subtitles. Uh, so those, those could be a great teaching tool as well. I think Yivo might also be a really great resource. They might know of a um, lot of additional uh, sites and lists of Yiddish films and books as well. Yes, so yeah, Yivo so Encyclopedia, Yivo. for example, would be a good place to start. Yeah. To look at that, yeah. All right, this person says, thank you. I will supplement my lessons with your lecture and slideshow, so. Happy to share slides as well. Great. All right, I think that concludes our program for today. Dr. Mazur, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, and to the rest of our audience, thank you as well for joining us wherever you are right now. Um, wishing you all peace and safety. And I hope to see you at the museum at Aldridge Street sometime very soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye.